You are on. Good morning. I'm laughing because my first day at Mount Holyoke, we had an orientation for freshmen at 7 o'clock in the morning, and the president of the University of Mount Holyoke College stood on the stage with her hands like this and said, ladies, the first thing that you must know is that it is not Mount Holyoke, tis Mount Holyoke. And I looked at the person next to me and said, I have to transfer right now. I am so, I so don't get this. And I never did, actually. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it is a particular honor to be giving this name lecture. I am such an admirer of the work that Michael Gordon has done over the years. And I admit that I actually may even have a crush on Harvey. Um, I'm also thrilled because I understand that as of the plenary yesterday, if I start to bomb, I can just pretend it was a simulation. Is that right? <laughs> so this is all good. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Um, if I can work the mouse, I'll be all set. Hmm. I don't think this is set up right. One sec. Let's see if this works. Is it working? So that's a triangle, right? And I am fascinated by how fascinated the healthcare industry seems to be with triangles. <laughs> this is the Institute of Medicine, six aims. It's in a triangle. This is the strategic plan of a large hospital. This is the healthcare strategy of a major employer. This poor thing is a government triangle. It's on a government website. <laughs> Can you tell? It's so poorly done that there are a bunch of rectangles laughing at it. <laughs> this is a touchy-feely triangle for people in healthcare who aren't too edgy and don't want to in, you know, insult anyone. That wouldn't be me. This is an upside-down triangle talking about uh, the information age in healthcare. I must be getting old. I can't even see my own slides. OK. This triangle looks like stinky cheese. It's a healthcare triangle. I don't want to say I thought it might be French. These are a bunch of arrows looking to become a triangle, as confused as many of us in healthcare are. They can't figure out how to get it together, and they aren't even labeled consistently. This is a triangle for a healthcare organization, and I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but this guy seems quite enamored of his triangle. <laughs> this is a triangle on drugs. <laughs> this is the triangle for the triple aim that we all strive for to improve the population of our health, the experience that our patients have in care, and the costs. These are, this is a triple set of triangles with no aim. This is the scariest healthcare triangle I have ever seen. I don't know who did this even, but I find it quite frightening. But in all of this, the thing that strikes me with this fascination we have is that, of course, the math majors in the room all know that this is the symbol for what? For change. I still, when I write sentences, I never write the word change out. I always put a triangle there. I had a very strict math teacher. Um, and that's what this is all about. This, if there's one thing that's constant in healthcare, it's change. And we are in the middle of such an unbelievable, well, I've been saying this since 1975. We're in the middle of such an incredible time in healthcare. Everything's changing. Isn't it fascinating? I can't imagine there's going to be a time when we're not saying that. But in healthcare, this sad triangle is driving a lot of what's going on. And that's the hypotenuse of this right triangle is the is the cost curve, if you even want to call it a curve. Particularly in the US, the costs keep going up. And if that isn't a driver for doing something, I don't know what is. But the people, the constituent groups that are driving the change in healthcare are the people who are paying for it, the people who are providing it, and the people who are receiving it and consuming it. But on top of that, the thing that's making an incredible difference and has completely changed the way we approach making change is the application of safety science to the healthcare industry, and that's what I'm going to talk about. This is a picture of the National Patient Safety Foundation's ex-exhibit hall. And for the last, I think this will be the fifth year, 
it is not an exhibit hall at our meeting anymore. It is a simulation and learning center. So about, I guess it's five years ago now, right, Jeff? I had a, uh, an idea. We were talking about our exhibit hall after our Congress. We have a, an annual meeting every year like this, multidisciplinary like yours. People across professions focused on patient safety. Patients come, um, academics, researchers, practitioners, the experts, the novices. It's a very interesting meeting, and we were always kind of not satisfied with the disconnect between the exhibit hall and our content of our meeting, particularly since people don't typically come to our meeting to spend a lot of money on stuff. They come to learn. And so I had this really cockamamie idea that maybe we could change the hall and give the solutions providers who were attending and showcasing their solution sets an opportunity to show off what they have to offer in um, real time, in action, in context. And at the same time, use that opportunity to expose patient safety advocates to simulation. It, and back then, when we started doing this, it was very obvious from conversations that we would have all the time with, with folks in patient safety that they really didn't have an appreciation for the breadth of simulation as an educational tool, as an educational approach. I had a tremendous appreciation for it because Jeff Cooper's been on our board since we were founded. And he was very um, effective in convincing us of the ties between patient safety and simulation. So we thought, I, I had this weird idea, I called Jeff up, he's the only person who listens to my weird ideas sometimes, and said, what would you think if we tried to do this, and we put simulations in the hall, and we had the exhibitors showcase their solutions in, in, uh, as they were functioning. And how about if we put one in each corner, and one would be uh, um, an emergency department setting, and one would be an inpatient unit, one would be a physician's office practice, and one would be a home, and we could simulate these solution sets in action, and we could actually simulate you know, conversations with patient and family members, and then maybe we could have, you know, aisles that go between each of them, and we could simulate the handoffs, and he said, "What well, you are insane, um, which I already knew, but um, he decided to take it on, and we started that first year. I think we had about five simulations running in the hall, and it was a remarkable experience, and we actually have gotten to the point where we have started um, doing simulation transitions, so we go from setting to setting. This is not a Rasasa Annie. This is a live screaming woman who um, goes into, she's in um, labor and she goes into crisis and so she gets wheeled across the exhibit hall to another simulation station to um, showcase, you know, the transitions in care and what should be done for those to be effective and for the safety of the uh, process to be honored. Um, there are many people in this room who contribute to this, including the society who helps us put this together and lots of folks from across the country from all of the simulation centers and uh, experts who help us put this together with uh, supporters like Lairdall and others to, um, to bring this into the, into the middle of the patient safety space. This, is, this meeting is the, is our, it'll be NPSS 15th year this year. It's the only meeting um, internationally that focuses only on patient safety and nothing else and it draws about 1,500 people. It's a great size, fabulous meeting, but this has made a huge difference. And the reason that I'm telling you this is because what we've done in this, through this mechanism and then adding uh, simulation plenaries is that we've taken people who really understand patient safety, those are the folks who come to this meeting, who didn't know very much about simulation. They knew what it was. There was an impression that you, know, you only got to use it if you were doing CPR lessons or you worked in a healthcare system that was rich and had a simulation center, and they didn't really understand the breadth of the discipline, the depth of the discipline, the low fidelity to high fidelity application, or what has been going on in uh, places like this during this course of time. And so our uh, interest was also in exposing patient safety folks more robustly and in more depth to what simulation has to offer. Today, my challenge is the reverse. I have to turn my hat around and my goal here is to help those of you who are experts in simulation, who understand patient safety but may not appreciate the depth of it 
or the challenges associated with its application in healthcare to understand better what it is that uh, the patient safety folks are challenged with and have you start thinking about additional ways in which you might be able to use simulation to help move the work along. So the essence of the patient safety work, and you all know this because you're educators and I know that you teach patient safety, is really what we did was we took lessons from high-risk industries and we translated those disciplines and applied them to the healthcare industry. NPSF started in 1997 after a meeting in uh, November 96 at the Annenberg Science Center on medical error. And that was a time when there, was, there were a lot of sentinel events, Betsy Lehman overdose, the wrong leg amputation in Tampa, the wrong side of the head surgery at my uh, um, alma mater, Sloan Kettering. There was a lot of angst in the, uh, in the public and there was a lot of concern in the industry that this was beginning to feel like a runaway trade and we really didn't understand it. There had been some preliminary research done by folks like Lucian Leap and others. Um, and we had this wonderful example in the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation of a discipline that had looked at error, that had effectively used safety science and simulation to make a huge difference in the safety profile of that particular clinical discipline. And we looked at the, um, the foundation, ASPF, and we decided to form a foundation that was multidisciplinary to focus on safety in the healthcare industry, and that was the um, genesis of the National Patient Safety Foundation. From the beginning, multidisciplinary, all-inclusive. There were 51 people on the original board. I was one of them. Jeff was on the board as well. Um, it was really interesting trying to form an organization with 51 people. Um, but nonetheless, that's what we did. Our job initially was to raise awareness of the issue and to start translating the, uh, the safety disciplines into application for healthcare. We um, basically took the folks who had started this work and surrounded them, put a table together, got some funding and surrounded them with people from multiple disciplines so that we could make sure that when we went down this path and used this work in healthcare that we were doing so thoughtfully and we were all inclusive in the approach. What happened as this started to take root in healthcare in a significant way was that it started to be treated um, disrespectfully initially, I think. People really thought it was a project. If you asked CEOs in hospitals or you looked at the surveys, what's your top priority? It was always, you know, finances, physician relationships, um, you know, workforce retention and maybe five, six, seven down on the list was patient safety as if this were a separate thing. It's not a separate thing. It's not a project. It's not something you do instead of something else. Um, there was a perception that it was the responsibility of somebody that you were gonna put a hat on in the quality improvement department or the risk management department or um, some other such thing. Uh, somebody was gonna be responsible for it. Somebody, not somebody's. Um, it's not an isolated discipline. It doesn't exist um, by itself. It can't function that way. It's not only about error mitigation, which originally was our major focus, primarily sentinel events. And it is not in competition with other disciplines. It is absolutely comp complementary. What it is actually is a way to, to make people pay attention. It's kind of interesting um, to me, having been through the evolution of the quality improvement discipline that it was a real struggle, as many of you know, for many years to get people to focus on quality improvement because the only way it seemed you could get people to focus was to try to measure it and then they'd argue over degrees and the measurement was never right and um, people didn't want to be measured and forget evidence-based practice and the, it, there was really an, in, an intent to try to optimize outcomes with what we were given to work with. Um, patient safety is different. People pay attention. It's a as you know, it's a lot more compelling to talk about not hurting someone and listening to situations where something went wrong and someone did get hurt. That makes people sit up a lot straighter than talking to them about a degree of quality improvement. What it is, as you know, is a framework for process improvement that uses safety science human factors engineering, behavioral psychology, et cetera, and applies them to process improvement in healthcare. The application of these disciplines, which we were not using in the quality improvement work, completely changed the way we looked at process improvement. And not only that, it completely changed our understanding of how 
fragile our health system was and how imperfect we were and how much we really needed to rethink how we were organizing our care and uh, what the uh, purpose of our process design was. Um, it is systems oriented and that is the thing that's made the big difference. Um, you can't do systems work and accept anything as a given, you question everything. Um, and I think in healthcare, most challengingly and most importantly, you question the culture because the culture contains either prohibitions to improving safety or facilitators to improving safety. And you can't ignore that. You can't do what we used to do and say, well, the doctor's always gonna be in charge and the patient can't ask any questions and the hospital administration keeps the hotel running and their hands are off clinical practice. That doesn't cut it when you take a systems approach. It is by definition, multidisciplinary and it's really a mindset. It's a way of doing things. It's not, it's not a separate thing. It is the way that we're now doing process improvement. It is ubiquitous. It's all consuming. It's, uh, it's a framework. It's in the DNA now of how we design process and how we evaluate how well we're doing. I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about what we're finding to be some of the biggest challenges. There are many challenges, as you know. There are multiple um, initiatives that have been successful in doing things such as reducing ventilator-associated pneumonia and claspies and things like that. And it's interesting that many of the things that we're doing that are resulting in safer practices are very simple and you know they're the kinds of things you go, oh my God, of course, why didn't I think of that before? Because it was too simple and we were too busy and we were thinking you know, greater thoughts. Um, so while all that stuff is going on and all of that is challenging, people are starting to accept the fact that variation isn't cool and there's nothing wrong with evidence-based practice. But these things are, are very big struggles of ours and what I wanna do is help you see what we see every day in the patient safety work and that is how the science is helping us but also what the tremendous challenges are that we have before us in each of these areas. And I'm gonna start with um, educating the professions. So MPSF has a think tank called the Lucian Leap Institute, um, obviously named for Lucian um, and his good work in patient safety. When we were formed on our 10th anniversary in 2007, we sat down and, and it was quite a, a group of individuals, Lucian, Carolyn Clancy, Don Berwick, Paul O'Neill, Dave Lawrence, um, people, uh, Julie Morath, people of very high regard, placed in very different spots around the, um, around the industry, very influential and very thoughtful who'd spent time thinking about this. And we organized our work into these five categories, which we called Transforming Concepts, and we um, published in the uh, British Medical Journal. One of them was reforming medical education, and this is a challenge because we know, we knew, we've recognized for some time that while we're doing this improvement work in real time with people who are practicing care and taking care of patients, that we're cranking people out of the pipe, educational pipelines that have no clue about this stuff because it wasn't part of the uh, curriculum or the curricula. We, we weren't taught it, we had to figure this all out. Um, and so what good is it doing us to make all these changes if we're not driving them back into education? And this is something of course which resonates with you. When we wrote this report, uh, the LEAP Institute, this was what we had identified as the challenges of the educational system. And this piece of work was intended to be a prototype for all the health disciplines, but it was too much to take them all on, so we focused on medical school curriculum as a prototype. Um, there were foci missing. You know, we were still, and still are, training um, medical students on the old model that's been in place for 100 years. And it doesn't include the things that we know are critical and important for systems work, safety work, setting up the culture, making sure that you have the tenets in place and you're supporting them and you're able to um, improve your safety profile. These things are all necessary. None of these things are being taught. It's competencies, it's skills, it's how to talk to people, it's empathy, it's all those types of things. Not only were we not teaching them, we're not looking for them when we admit people to school to begin with. And quite frankly, we ended up with a lot of people um, in the industry who didn't handle the pressure well, and um, turned out to be somewhat unpleasant to our patients. Um, 
These are some of the design failures that we mentioned in our report. You'll note, of course, that it's a lot of what you're doing now. And insufficient use of simulation came out very loud and strong in this report. Uh, we had an expert roundtable of about 45 folks in addition to the LEAP people. That's how we do this work. Um, people from licensing boards and deans of colleges, et cetera, educators, LAMC. Um, and we came up with actually 22 um, recommendations that were unique to this roundtable, even though everyone sitting at the roundtable in their own organizations had been working on this for some time. It was just the nature of the, nature of the roundtable. We organized um, the final 12 recommendations into three categories. And it doesn't look all that different what's in this report from what you're seeing in the Interprofessional Educational Collaborative Core Competencies, which I know you're all quite familiar with and um, supportive of. It's all about patient-centered care with teamwork um, and, and understanding that you need to be able to um, learn together. You can't, start, you can't expect people to start working in teams when they put their feet on the hospital floor. They should be training and learning in teams before they get there so it's more natural. Um, and this wasn't happening. This is um, what I think is a fascinating depiction of what it means to be a team-oriented person. This is from a plenary that we had years ago with Tom Kelly, who's the president of IDEO, which is a design firm many of you may be familiar with. But they talk about team, and he uh, describes the, a team person as a T-shaped person with a, someone with a deep knowledge of a discipline, such as you have in simulation, but at the same time, an empathy across other disciplines. And, and they very specifically say empathy. It's not just you understand simulation and you get the fact that you know surgeons do this and, and nurses do that and the administrative staff does this. It's empathy for those professions. It's a real understanding of what it is that they do go through, have to do, as part of the team to make the entire process better. And um, I think that's exactly what the challenge is for all of you is to take your deep knowledge of simulation and help deploy it across the disciplines. So your opportunities are to reach into this delivery system that we have, such as you know we went from the delivery system and reached back into the educational system for that work we did with the LEAP Institute. So too, you should be reaching from the educational system out into the practice setting, which I know you do um, in many of the simulation um, initiatives that you, that you design and uh, deploy, but there's so much opportunity there to use the safety science and facilitate the learning uh, via simulation that it's, uh, it's remarkable. And it's daunting for people who are practicing care every day to learn all of this stuff anew while they're trying to make sure they don't drop um, anything with the patients they're taking care of. So, there's a second challenge in education, and that's educating the people who are in the delivery systems today doing the work. Um, I don't know if you can read this from there, but it says, your pr proposal is innovative. Unfortunately, we won't be able to use it because we've never tried something like that before. You have no idea how many times people who are trying to do patient safety work and bring change and new approaches into healthcare meet with something like this. And they, they need to be educated. NPSF started a multidisciplinary society much like this with patient safety as the organizing principle. It created an online patient safety curriculum that covers the uh, foundational um, knowledge of patient safety. The faculty are our board members who better to do it than them. It has CME across multiple disciplines. It's intended to be multidisciplinary. It's intended to give a really good understanding of the science of safety and its application into healthcare across the issue. So it is an online, um, very inexpensive learning module. And the reason that we designed this is because we realized that there wasn't anything out there. And how can we be expecting people to do this work when they don't even have the basic foundational understanding of the science and its application, and therefore the context and the whys to, to the work? The other thing that we did is, much like you did this year, developed a credential for patient safety. Same challenges, same incredibly uh, rigorous and painful process. Um, 
multidisciplinary, um, and we set up the first certification for uh, expertise in patient safety. Examination is across six domains. The thing that's interesting about it is that after all of that work in the psychometrics and the, and the uh, item writing and the study of practice, et cetera, there are 100 questions on this exam, and only two of them are recall, and all the rest of them are application and analysis. When we were doing this, I can't tell you how many times I said, people who take this test really ought to be tested via simulation. To, to test them on application of this in scenarios on a piece of paper is not really what we should be doing. We should be figuring out a way to use simulation to test people's true ability to apply this work and uh, evidence this expertise. So when you figure that out, that would be great. The thing that's interesting to me when I look at the data, and I think we have about 300 people credentialed right now. This exam is available internationally. The pass rate in the first cut of data hasn't changed much, 72.4%. When you cut the data by discipline, you'll see that it differs. And our, my friends in the uh, pharmaceutical world told me that they're not allowing anyone else to take the test <laughs> because they, they're at 100%. But um, not surprisingly, nursing did quite better than average. Um, physicians, not quite as much. And people who had um, certifications or degrees that were focused in risk management, quality improvement, didn't do as well as I thought they were going to do. The, when we first launched the test, we had, I think the first day that it was available, uh, a physician called our office and he was furious because he, 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 he didn't pass the test. And he um, had quite a conversation with the person who answered the phone and one of the things he said was that, that this test is a sham so I said to her, gee, really what I would have loved to have said to him is if it were a sham, you would have passed it. Um, it's a rigorous test. It's a professional credential. It is uh, appropriate across the disciplines as the work is. But the thing that I find most fascinating is if you look inside, so the nursing profession, as an example, had a 78% pass rate. But when you look at the nurses and you cut them by job category, the closer you get to the patient, the worse your pass rate gets. So the Nurse executives passed this at a 91% pass rate. Nurses who had patient safety officer titles of some sort that weren't vice presidential or above, 83% pass rate against an average of 72.4%. Risk management title, 89%. You get down to mid-level managers, unit directors, their pass rate dropped down to 60, below average. But when you got to nurses, who define themselves as bedside practitioners, where we keep thinking all the answers are, they are doing terribly on this test. If you look at the physician, the same thing happens. It's the exact same thing. When you get to physicians who are practicing patient care and don't have administrative jobs, they, they have a 50% pass rate. What this is saying to me is that the people at the bedside are so good at what they do and they're incredible at the tasks that they're given to do, but we haven't given them the foundational science to help them understand why the heck they're doing it and um, position them to be uh, as much of champions as they could be for this work. And, and shame on us for that because we seem to be educating ourselves at the top and not taking care of the people who really need to know this stuff. So there are opportunities, I think, in this area of the work that is so critical now, educating people in school and helping to educate people um, in the practice settings where simulation could really help us move this ball forward in some fashion. You, you know, you have educational approaches that are different. They are more new age than the old way of teaching people. They are more engaging because they're interactive. People learn better um, when they're able to interact. Um, there are applications for the curriculum, as I had indicated. There should be a, a, a applications for the credentialing exam if we could figure out how to do it. The credentialing exam is being looked at by the medical subspecialty boards because the medical subspecialties are requiring patient safety um, capabilities or proof of patient safety education or practice in their maintenance of certification requirements. It's um, mandated in a couple of the specialties and it will be in all of them. There's nothing in, in uh, nothing for them to offer. There was simply a requirement there. You need to do this, but there was nothing to do. So they're looking at the possibility, and in fact, I think it's gonna happen, of using the curriculum and the credential 
um, as ways in which physicians and specialties can um, satisfy their MOC requirements. So it would seem to me that there should be some incredible opportunity to marry simulation into that set of processes and make that really what it should be, which is a hands-on evidence of um, being able to practice. And I'm sure there are lots of other things. The other, the second of the um, areas I want to focus on that is a huge issue for us is the issue of culture. And I know you had a great plenary yesterday, even though apparently it didn't seem to be that way at the beginning, um, about culture. And, and Ed Schein, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, he is one of the top organizational um, theorists in the, in the country, and internationally actually. And this is his definition of culture, which basically is, it's the way we do things around here. And what he, what he tells us, and he's done a lot of work with us, is that you just can't say I'm going to change the culture because by definition, the culture is comprised of the way people take what they have at hand and the circumstances that they work in and the situations they're dealt with, and it's the way that they do their work, given those things. And the only way you can change a culture, and this is the way he describes it, artifacts, values, and, um, and um, assumptions, the only way you can change a culture is to give people a better way to do the work. And if it's better, they'll start to do it that way, and they'll stop doing it the way that isn't as effective, and that, ipso facto by definition, will become the new culture, and that's how you have to go about doing it. Well, that is not a quick process. And a lot of the frustration in the patient safety field is um, with the slowness of the change. But when you think about what we're trying to do, when you think about the fact that this is systems approach, that we're trying to change the very culture of our healthcare industry and the culture of medicine, while we change practices, while we uncover errors that we didn't know we have, while we look at near misses, while we set up reporting systems, while we start to understand that we need to engage patients differently, there's a lot to do. This is a critical piece of that. So you would think, healthcare industry, we love innovation, we're so smart, we love new things, new medicine, new technology, we can't get enough of that. We would be so receptive to change, and yet, this is more what we're like, unfortunately. I don't know if you've seen this clip, but have you seen this? You know how many people I've worked with in my many years in healthcare who think that way? That's why it's so important to do everything we can to get people to be receptive to the things that they have to do. This is the role of culture. It's, it's what Shine says. It's the, it, it is the context for the work. It's the permission. The culture gives people permission to talk about things that go wrong, which we never used to have, to look for things that go wrong, to look for near misses, to try to figure out how to make things better, to not be afraid to speak up. All those things are new to our healthcare industry, and none of them were possible until we, until we started to push on the culture. We couldn't just do those things. I remember when we started talking about a lot of those things, apologizing to patients, what are you, crazy? You know how what'll happen in malpractice um, suits? They'll go sky high. Well, guess what? It didn't happen. But, None of that was possible until we started to actually realize that we needed to change the culture and start doing it. And so it's continuously reshaped. This is iterative. You know, you make improvements and it becomes a new culture. The real problem we have in healthcare, and I'll touch on this a little bit with the business case, is that our biggest problem in healthcare is we come up with new ways to do stuff all the time. We don't let go of the old ways. 
So we keep adding stuff on top of what we're doing instead of replacing things because we don't have time to go about doing that. And what we do is we make things, in some cases, worse for ourselves. So you probably talked about this a bit yesterday when you talked about the just culture, but, and you all know what high reliability organizations are, and I think the thing that was most kind of shocking when we started talking about this is this whole you know, collective mindfulness and vigilance that you need to come to work every day expecting that something's gonna go wrong. It was like, wow, what a bummer person that would be. Be like, you know, who wants to work with somebody who comes to work every day thinking everything's gonna go wrong? That sounds awful, but um, that's what you have to do. You have to come in expecting things to fail in order to be vigilant enough and have the kind of mindfulness you need to create a high reliability organization where you have consistent safe performance. That's not what we had in healthcare. We had the antithesis of what was needed for that to happen. This is what we inherited when we started doing this work in earnest. It seemed absolutely impossible to start to replicate some of what we were seeing elsewhere in other industries because of all these things. Well, as it turns out, it wasn't so impossible. And a lot of these things have started to move. There are things that we're doing that 15 years ago, I would have said there's no way in heck we're ever gonna do that, and we're doing it. These are the characteristics of a patient safety culture. These are the things that allow us to do the work. But each and every one of these things is something that we had to manufacture anew and place into our healthcare system in the past decade. So what does that mean? That means that we all have to be taught how to do all this stuff. Some of it we had to even make up. We didn't learn this in school, medical school, business school. This is all stuff that we really didn't understand. Some of it we kind of were committed to you know, intellectually maybe, but in practice, this isn't where we were. So you can't do the work unless your culture looks like that. It, it, just, it just doesn't happen. You have to have transparency. People have to feel comfortable speaking up and all the things that you know about patient safety. So where are your oppor opportunities? Well. This is all work that's not academic or theoretical. This is all application of the science in the settings. There's so much that needs to be done to get us to where we need to go. Even though we've come pretty far, it pales in comparison to what we have left to do. So there are all sorts of opportunities, I believe, for people with your tremendous skill sets and expertise and understanding of patient safety and ability to use simulation to educate folks um, and to help people learn how to do things before they get into a situation where it's critical, where they're touching a patient or they're interacting with a professional um, colleague. Uh, and this, this involves you being more than just educators. This involves you being patient safety leaders and champions, finding ways to partner with people who do quality improvement and uh, patient safety work in organizations. Um, Figuring out how to use simulation effectively to teach people the tools of safety science. You know, these things don't just come to people in their sleep. Everybody knows that they have, I mean, we've got a curriculum. It'll tell people what an RCA is, but it really doesn't mean anything until you actually do it. Um, FMEAs, things like that. Um, the healthcare industry was never really considered a learning environment, except in academic medical centers, perhaps. But the thrust, the IOM report, um, that's the, the round table that uh, is on um, learning environments is all about trying to make the healthcare delivery system a learning environment. Who better knows how to do that than people who educate? Um, we really don't know how to do that. We're trying to figure it out. It's not that hard, but there's a, lot, there's a huge opportunity for simulation here. Um, I'm not gonna go through this. Here's the challenge of patient engagement, so this is this is the third of the four things I'm gonna talk about. So we all know that every patient is different. Every family is different. You can't treat everyone the same. You know how long this was an excuse for us. Every physician is different and every one of his patients or her patients is different and every one of their biologies is different and everyone, everybody's different. So there's no such thing as standard practice and there's no such thing as elimination of variation because all variation can be justified by the fact that every patient is different. Um, you can't treat everything the same. Can you read this? I love this slide. Every patient is different. Every treatment of every patient's condition is different. We loved our variation. 
If you ask patients really what they want, there are some very basic common things. This is the definition of the National Partnership of Women and Families, um, friends of ours who talk to patients and this is what they want. Whole person care, coordination, support, empowerment. I want what I need when I, when I need it. This is a um, universal patient compact that MPSF designed, which is not a list of what patients' rights are. It's a list of what patients want articulated as commitments that we will make to them as providers. And it's a list of what we should be able to expect from patients. So if patients want to be respected, they also need to respect the provider and the commitment the provider's made to educating him or herself to be able to treat them. This is, this is a patient bill of rights for this century. There, the value of patient and family-centered care is being proven all over the place. There's correlation between um, patient experience and outcomes. There's correlation between workforce satisfaction and patient experience. But we still have a long way to go. We know we need to engage patients and educate them. This is always the fear, oh my god, I'm going to open the door and I'm going to get just, you know, I just spent a week with my 88-year-old mother. So um, when I ask her a question, that is what happens every single time. <laughs> But this is, this, there's a balance that has to be found. It's not impossible, but what's missing in this arena of the safety um, er, uh, work is that we, this is the one area where we haven't really taken a systems approach. We treat every patient differently. We know we need to engage them. We know they need to be part of the team. We know they need to be educated. But if you go to an organization that's really, really good at that and gets it and does it really, really, really well, you're lucky. And if you move from that organization to another place, physician office practice, if you get another provider who gets that, does it really, 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 really well, you're double lucky, but guess what? That is not gonna look anything like what the other person did because there's no systems approach. So at our very, very best, we're making patients relearn how to engage every time we see them because everybody does it differently. Um, so we need a systems approach. We need engineering disciplines. I sit on a workforce for the IOM for that roundtable. The workforce group that I sit on is um, all about application of engineering principles into healthcare. So we've done a good job so far, but we haven't gone anywhere near as far as we need to go. And there are a lot of other engineering disciplines we need to use. This is a mass customization problem. And we don't use that discipline when we design patient engagement um, processes or programs. Um, we need to define their roles. Leap Institute has a roundtable ongoing on this work. Um, there are a lot of things coming out of that round table. They're not surprising. There are all these things you see there. They're the things that people talk about. Take your pick. We don't know how to do this. We have been unsuccessful at effectively educating and engaging patients, not to mention educating the general public so that they know this stuff before they present as patients. So there are so many opportunities for simulation discipline to jump into this and help us understand how to be receptive, how to engage patients, under, uh, help us educate patients on how to be part of the team, et cetera. The last one I'm gonna talk about is uh, accelerating care integration. This is another huge challenge. And I'm not gonna go through this. Um, I'm gonna just go through it quickly because I see I'm getting close to time. But we have another LEAP rounds table, round table that's just published a paper on this. Um, it's, ju it's just come out. Um, and we just had a webinar on it last week. When we talk about integrating care, we are talking about integrating around the patient. We are not talking about integrating governance structures and integrating risk and, in, and you know, getting efficiencies of scale and administrative practices. What we mean by care integration is the process and thoughtful design of care for the benefit and protection of the patient. And integrated care is the outcome of that. And it is coordinated, it is patient-centered, it's not a structural thing. It's the way we support our patients. There are components of it that are important to ensure that it's effectively integrated. It is. We do recognize that it has to be patient-specific at a certain level of care, but that does not mean that there aren't commonalities in this, in this set of processes that apply to everyone that we shouldn't get people used to so that they have an easier way of engaging. 
Uh, measuring it will be very, very difficult, but this is the big challenge of the healthcare reform work right now and the ACO movements, and it's not unlike what happened in the 80s and 90s that I lived through when we went to do physician hospital organizations and we were going to capitation from fee-for-service, and it fell on its face for a lot of reasons. One, I used to call it BAUID, business as usual in drag. People took what they had and they relabeled it and thought it was going to work, and it didn't. And we didn't have infrastructure. We didn't understand how to do things differently, how to manage risk differently, um, how to integrate care. The challenges here are incredible, and we need help if we're going to form effective integrated care organizations or we're going to fall on our faces again. And so there has to be tremendous opportunity for your expertise in this process. And I was asked to speak quickly about the business case. That's our other challenge. What's the value proposition for patient safety? You know, if you look at it at a macro level, there's a lot of money being wasted in the healthcare system. This is just the U.S. There's huge waste. And that waste breaks down into a lot of things that are being addressed through the patient safety work. Patient safety is probably a misnomer at this point. It's really process improvement. But patient safety is the way we describe safety science in our, in our environment. So much of this, over 550 billion of that waste, is stuff that's being addressed through the work that's under the umbrella of patient safety. There's another triangle again, it's that same graph kind of looked at this way, if you wanted to keep um, the spend as a percentage of the GNP even out to 2020, you'd have to deal with all those things above that flat line, and those are all those pieces of waste that are in the system that we're trying to get at through the safety work. This is what the Institute of Medicine says you have to have if you're going to do a business case on patient safety. You have to have the following elements included. They're really talking about what you do at the micro level. Look at this. I mean, just doing a cost-benefit analysis, just trying to figure out what something costs and what you're receiving as a benefit is hard enough, but if you think about doing it correctly and you have to include all these variables, it's not an easy chore. There are some very good examples I'm sure you're all familiar with where the ROI has been proven. They're all over the place. They're small. They're individual systems and institutions. There are studies that have been done by the Business Group on Health looking across the industry and picking out the costs of things so that you know if you fix them how much you're going to save. This is what people want to know when they go into their organizations and ask for money for simulation and safety programs. There's a, a couple of good studies that came out in June of last year, I don't know if you saw them, that are kind of looking at the literature and the analysis of the business case. The basic conclusion is that we haven't been able to do this effectively, but that shouldn't stop people from trying to pursue the work. So this is your challenge as simulation experts and educators to help the patient safety movement and become leaders in the movement, in not only in educating people, but also in helping improve practice. And it's to develop deeper expertise. It's to get yourself to uh, involved in these things where you can learn about the science. There are easy ways to do it now, user-friendly ways to do it. Reach out to your providers and find ways to partner, ones in your community. Bring your expertise to bear inside the delivery system and be leaders in this movement because we absolutely need you. So I'm out of time. I'm probably over. But thank you very much. And if you have any questions, you can catch me after.